Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Abigail Posner. You guys still awake? Yes, clap if you're awake. Yay, all right, good. Okay, I know, I know, we're almost done. You know, it's funny that we're talking about language a lot today because when I first joined Google and I would have conversations with my clients or my colleagues about the digital space, I would often hear words like data, ROI, performance, algorithm, and I would never hear words like meaningful, emotionally resonant, human. And so I started scratching my head and wondering, is digital human? I mean, is it, or maybe just human enough? And at Google, at my role, I get to ask questions like that. Now, when I was a brand planner in advertising for many years, I used to work side by side with anthropologists to understand, to unearth the relationship, the deep nature of our relationship with products and brands. And so in this case, I did the same thing. I worked side by side with the anthropologists again, added some neuroscience, some psychology to the mix, to try to understand, A, do we actually have a deep relationship with digital, and B, how meaningful is it? And what we discovered was fascinating. Because you see, digital isn't just human enough. It actually amplifies human experience, allowing us to tap and assert and unleash deep-seated human needs and desires and aspirations, in some cases like never before. And I'm gonna share with you some of those ways. One that's physical in nature, we call it placemaking. The other is, believe it or not, highly intellectual. We call it synaptic play. And the third is very emotional and we call it energy exchange. Okay, let's begin. There is no question that we cannot live without our mobile phones, right? I mean, there's no way I would have gotten to this stage on time without my map and without my schedule app. But our relationship with mobile goes far deeper than that. And I'm gonna share with you one example. Now, of course, we live in a highly virtual world where we can have hangouts with people from Timbuktu, Tokyo, and Toronto all at the same time. And yet, we fundamentally still need and want to connect with the physical places and spaces and things that surround us. That's why we care about decorating our homes or the dive, the local dive around the corner. These places ground us emotionally. They serve as our foundational compass. They orient us. Even Winston Churchill said, we shape our buildings and afterwards our buildings shape us. Every place has our memories attached to it. And these memories constantly remind us of who we are. And we call this act of adding meaning and value to places in anthropology, we call it placemaking. And mobile allows us to placemake like never before because of all the different applications, picture taking, investigating, texting, calling. Now what do I mean by that? Let me give you an example. I live in Hell's Kitchen in New York. Who's been to Hell's Kitchen? All right, okay, so you know, right? It's restaurant after restaurant after restaurant. And usually I just pass them by. But imagine this, I'm walking down the street, I happen upon a restaurant, it catches my fancy, right then and there, I can investigate. Ah, when was that restaurant founded? Who's the chef? What's the cuisine like? I'm interested, I step inside, I get the best seat in the house thanks to Yelp. I order a dish, it's gorgeous, so what do I have to do? I have to take a selfie, take a picture of the, of the dish, right? So I text it, I send it to my friends. One of my friends immediately texts me back and says, oh my gosh, I love that restaurant because that's where my husband proposed to me. Oh, and by the way, add some chipotle sauce to the, to the dish, it'll taste so much better. All of that, that investigating, that picture taking, that texting, all of that, all of that allows me to add meaning and value to a restaurant that I would have just passed by. Now what's an app 
that recognizes this insight? Field trip. What's amazing about field trip is on any street, you pass by a building or a monument or a sculpture, and through the portal of your mobile device, you get layers of story about that artifact, about that monument. So what happens is your everyday street turns into a living museum. How cool is that? Now, all of you are brand builders in the audience, so you're probably thinking, all right, this sounds good, but show me an example of a brand that's leveraged this. Ah. Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan's a brand, right? And he had to promote his new album, The Tempest. That's a sub-brand. Now, what I love about this example is that for so long, Bob Dylan had eschewed the digital space, and then he did a flip of the switch. And by the way, I have to tell you, he has done some funky-ass stuff recently, and we could talk about it at uh, cocktails, but, but I'll go back to this. So what did he do? To promote his album, he created a mobile-only campaign called Sound Graffiti. It's an iPhone app. You may be familiar with it. And so what happens is he would associate his music, the music from The Tempest, to particular places and spaces that ha would have significance to him. So you'd happen upon a place and, and you'd, you'd be able to unlock a song. So what happens is you happen upon some local building or site, right? And not only do you get the surprise and delight of hearing a new song, but then you associate that music to that place, adding more meaning and value to that building or to that monument in your local environment. Love that. Awesome. Now, it's one thing to have the surprise and delight of hearing a new song, right? But it's a whole other thing of having the surprise and delight of hearing a song that you're familiar with brought to you in a new way. Have a listen. One more time. All right, that's pretty wet. Whoopee. We're going back. Okay, we won't go back, because then you get to hear this guys again. Okay, no, perfect. So, what's going on here? Right? This stuff is bonkers, redonkulous. I mean, who has time to do all this, create all this craziness in the web? And if it's not this, right, that we're watching, it's it's crazy baby smoking, and it's cats flying, and now it's, it's dog, the, the, what's the she dog, whatever that thing, right? I mean, there's all this crazy crap out there. But this isn't a sign of stupidity or zaniness, but a sign of brilliance. And before you doubt it, think about it. How do we define brilliance, anyway? Like, what does it mean to be brilliant? It means that you come up with amazing ideas. And how are those ideas formed? When we connect two seemingly disconnected, unrelated notions or concepts that when brought together, reveal something amazing. Chocolate and peanut butter, you know? Now at the level of neuroscience, this happens when, lovely, thank you, when synapses fire up in our brains, right? Synapses are the connections between the neurons. Now here's where it gets really interesting. Because the more we're exposed to random, disconnected, unrelated stimuli, the more connections we will make. Neuroscience tells us that we are hardwired to want to make connections. We seek it out. We dig it. Leonardo da Vinci discovered this centuries ago. He said the human brain cannot fathom a series of unrelated, disconnected notions or concepts or objects without us trying to connect them. We need to. We dig it. We love it. Now, what does that have to do with the web? Ah. Because when you jump into the, the web, what you get is a whole array of images and clips, be them old or new, or from a world away or our own backyard, right? And there's no filtering by some outside source. And you have this freedom to, to start exploring and adventuring through all these worlds. And then you get exposed to something, right? 
And you go, oh, this is interesting. Now, wait a second. And you get exposed to something over here, and that's interesting. And then all of a sudden, right, the synapses start firing and snap. You come up with some awesome ideas. And we call this synaptic play. And it's here where this makes perfect sense. <laughs> Why? Because somebody's meandering through all these clips and these images, and he hears that the end note of the screaming goat, which happens to be a B flat, tell me if I'm wrong, right? Also happens to be the high note of Les Mises, Who Am I, and One Day More. And he goes, oh, I see what's going on. And he, 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 he downloads them, and he splices them, and he edits them, and he uploads them and shares them with the world. And even if we're not the ones creating all this synaptic play, what's happening is we're getting exposed to it, right? Even if we're just watching it or witnessing it, we're trying to make this connection. We're engaging our brain and we're going, wait a second, what's going on? I'm liking this. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see what's going on here. Ooh, this is good. This is good. And you know what we're saying back to the creator? We're saying, I like the way you synapse. And it inspires us. It makes us think, oh, oh, maybe I can do this too, right? Maybe not now. Or it actually does inspire new thoughts. Because think about it. How many iterations of the screaming goat have there been? Hundreds, right? My daughter can't sing Taylor Swift's Trouble without adding the screaming goat to her song. Because that's what she's heard more than anything else, right? And so no wonder. This became a darling of the award shows last year, right? What is this? What is this? Dumb, dumb ways to die. Come on, you can sing it, right? Dumb ways to die, because what dumb ways to die did, I mean, this is, this is a PSA from Melbourne, Australia. What did they do, right? This, the, the message here was don't cross the train tracks because something bad may happen. You may die. It's a pretty serious message, right? But instead of doing what they probably would have done five years ago, which is let's hire a really good documentary filmmaker and create something that would just, you know, make you cry, they leveraged the synaptic play that's here. They took a very serious message, married it to an upbeat song, right? Adding child childlike imagery and very morbid scenes, and boom, there you go. And we dug it. We stayed attentive, we got engaged, and our brains were trying to figure it all out. Now another example, brand example, and this, this brand, this is from um, UK telecom company three. They actually do quite a few of these examples of synaptic play. This is, I think, their most recent, and, and the, the reason why I want to show it to you too is that not only do they create a piece of synaptic play, but then they engage you, the audience, the viewer, to continue and be synaptic yourself. Have a watch. I remember when I shared this with my colleagues in New York, and they were so psyched, you know, to put their faces in there. And then they figured out that you could only do it in the UK, and they were so pissed at me for like a week. But what you're seeing here, I mean, look at all the associations that we're, our brains are forced to make. We have become associative thinkers, not just linear thinkers anymore. Leverage that. Take advantage of that. Now, clearly, we're all cracking up, right? And what we've observed, and I know you know this is no big aha, but you know, we've got the data to show it. What we've observed, and what we learned from our research, is that so many of these examples of synaptic play, and even those that actually weren't necessarily all synaptic play, the ones that kept on getting shared a lot, not all of them, but a lot, were those that engendered that belly laugh. You know, that, that gasp of energy, that sense of effervescence. Why? Why do we like to share this stuff? Ah, we like to share it because of the rush of pleasure we feel when we know others are experiencing it with us. Are we being altruistic? No. We're hardwired to want to do this. Watch this. See how the babies react? From our very first months of life, 
we learn that by offering others a gift of happiness, we get that much more in return. What's our first emotional reaction? It's the smile, or Donald Winnicott calls it the social smile. And what happens when we smile at our moms or dads? What happens? They smile back! And babies feel this rush of pleasure because they know they're loved. They know they're bonded. And this extends to our larger social network as well. We learn that by offering others gifts of happiness, we get that much more in return. That's why we tickle our young. Even chimps tickle their young to elicit this, <laughs> you know, that ugly laugh reaction, that just instinctive belly laugh, because they know it will bind them. So when we share a crazy laugh out loud, energy inducing video or clip or meme, it's not crazy, right? No. And we're not just sharing it. We are sharing in it. And we're not any longer just a consumer of all this energy. We are a provider of it too, constantly fueling this connection we have with others. And we call this the energy exchange. And it's the energy exchange that reminds us that to you and to you and to you, I matter. So you see, oh, I should share with you some awesome examples, actually, before I, I give my little summary. I mean, you guys know about this one, right? Pepsi Max and Jeff Gordon Presents. This garnered 33 million views in the first month on YouTube because it was freaking funny. And by the way, it wasn't, you know, it was totally in line with the brand proposition. It wasn't crazy. And here's one of my favorites. Okay, how many of you have seen a really good tampon commercial, right? How about like a funny tampon commercial? Never. You have? Which one? Ah, there you go, there you go, you got, you stole my thunder, yes, yes. Hello Flow. Okay, Hello Flow created a long form piece of hilarity, only for the digital space, by the way. They didn't show some, you know, 25-year-old in white pants dancing with pearls, you know, dancing around. No, what they did is they took a 12-year-old sassy girl, used her as their spokesperson, and she basically created a mob ring for sanitary protection products in her camp. And then Hello Flow comes and usurps her position and she's pretty pissed. And by the way, overnight, the brand became a success because of this ad. Now, if I had time, I would show it to you, but you guys can look it up and, and have a good laugh. So now I will summarize. <laughs> Clearly, the digital space offers a great amount of data and great fear ROI and tons of cool algorithms, but it's more than that. It's meaningful. It's, it is replete with emotional value. And I know if anybody cares about that, it's all of you brand builders who spend day in and day out creating emotional connections with your customers. So as you think about developing your digital campaigns in the coming weeks, months, years, ask yourself, when it comes to mobile especially, are you encouraging placemaking? Are you helping people dimensionalize their neighborhoods because it's so important to them? Are you fueling synaptic play? Remember, we're associative thinkers. We're not linear thinkers anymore. Push it out. Let them play, be playful, see what happens. And then finally, gift happiness. Be a source of energy. Because people won't just like you more, they will feel that much more connected to you as a result. I, I really hope I can meet as many of you as possible at the cocktail hour, and I, I truly look forward to seeing what you all create in the digital space in the coming months. Thank you.